uh, hello, uh, I hope that you can hear me. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Yes. Um, hello. Uh, I'm Adina, uh, and we will start the second part of the first panel. Um, in the program is uh, moderated by Ovidio, but uh, Ovidio is a little bit occupied, um, busy right now. So uh, Manuela uh, will start the session and then Ovidio uh, will continue. Um, also, I, I, I wanted to say that on Facebook, uh, on YouTube, uh, if you have uh, questions and if you want to add something else, please use your um, real name or the name that you, uh, not a nickname, it, it, it's because to identify you a little bit. Um, so. Uh, Manuela, you can start and then uh, after the first one, when uh, Ovidio is available, uh, we will continue with the Ovidio also. Thank you very much, Adina, and welcome everyone. Welcome back to those of you who were with us in the morning. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, like for the first time ever um, at the Telchu Summer Conferences, um, this is Telchu behind me. We are trying to compensate for the lack of social contact uh, on Zoom by at least creating the illusion that we are also physically in Telchu because this is the roots and the basis of how the Telchu Summer Conferences and the Telchu Summer School have been conceived, namely thinking about rurality and modernity from the place um, that one is talking about, in this case, from the village and specifically from Telchu. So um, I invite you to engage in this exercise of imagination, just to make sure that the atmosphere that we cannot completely recreate, but we can struggle to recreate, brings us all together the way it does in Telchu. So um, for those of you who were there in the morning, we ended by having lunch at this uh, wonderful restaurant in um, Telchu, which is um, Restaurant Casanova. I'm not uh, doing any kind of uh, advertising for it, but they do make great samale. We had wonderful samale there, and that was for a sunny summer day, a bit of a heavy, decision. So um, I suggest we move to the chilly hills of Telchu. Um, so we can take a bit of a stroll and kind of shape this session around, or at least let it be framed by the idea that we're getting cooled off and kind of immersing in the landscape of a Transylvanian village. This being said, let us delve into the second part of our session. We have three presentations, um, different uh, from the program. Um, unfortunately, Valer Cosma, the mastermind behind the Telchu Summer Conferences cannot present, but he's uh, with us spiritually. Um, and then we will proceed in the order of the program, just skipping Valer's presentation. So we have um, women power, to the max for this panel. We have three uh, women presenters and I am very happy to um, introduce them very briefly. Um, since we have three presentations, you can almost take your time, which means you have 20 minutes. Try to stick to that time so we have ample time for discussion. It was um, kind of uh, productive to really have a lot of time this morning as well. So I hope um, you and I and everyone who's listening has the opportunity to really ask questions and think about stuff and come back to the questions. So please stick to your 20 minutes. Uh, and we will have all three presentations and then go to the discussion at the end. So we're starting with uh, Marina Mironico from um, the Humboldt University in Berlin and her presentation, Creating and Losing the Common Urban Space, the case study of the paintbrush factory from Cluj, Romania. Please, you have the floor. Hello, I'm glad to be here. I will share the presentation with you. Maybe it will be helpful to, to see a little bit of the... So, is it... 
Yes. So as uh, Manuela presented me, I'm uh, I'm trying to explain you a little bit about the the paintbrush factory in Cluj, about which some of you may know some. For uh, yeah. and what is Fabrica de Pensule? As uh, its name is in Romanian and in English, the Paintbrush Factory is a contemporary art space opened in a former Paintbrush Factory in 2009, and which was this is of this factory until 2019, and now. See this uh, question mark is uh, in the future because the the Bendos factory now is uh, working in a uh, so to say restrained format. Uh, uh, without the is they had before in this uh, in this uh, and they were from different parts of uh, of this contemporary art scene they were plastic art uh, artists performative uh, artists uh, the the paintbrush factory uh, is for a few future spaces so it was a pretty mixed up space with different uh, with different which uh, we'll see in the future will bring also some, some difficulties. But was also what I was, uh, what have I been looking at uh, for, for this presentation particularly, I'm interested in how was created and then how has shrunk the public presence of the this urban space called the Painbrush Factory. And here you see the methodology. It was qualitative. I was doing interviews and content analysis of different documents and strategies. And also I was doing participatory uh, observations since I was uh, working and collaborating the space for a, for a while. And here is a little bit of, um, of context in terms of theory. And, uh, the discussions, the, the discussion for today, and uh, obviously the the theoretical contribution of, of Lefebvre is very important here because space, as he says, is permeated by social relations. It is not only sustained by social relations, but it is also a producer and product of social relations, which was the case as nothing. Uh, uh, in the best in the best uh, way uh, uh, for the for the paintbrush factory and these social relations will be of another nature after the the emergence of industrial complexes their space being uh, luxuries and uh, uh, becoming somehow very very particular and very different for what they have been before and this conflict of what these spaces have been before the arrival of the artists and while they are stay there and in the future is uh, and remains a largely unresolved uh, conflict. From the economic perspective, in 2009, the Penbush factory was a vacant space, uh, which meant that it was impossible to be exploited on the real estate market. And uh, even though uh, the discussions is, is very often oriented toward the, the owner, the renting artists, they were also uh, aware and they regarded the space of the Penbrush factory as a way to fill in the interstices created by the global financial crisis, which was in, in, in around the time and the city urban, uh, cities urban development regulations. Uh, so, each part of this uh, of, of this process has 
had their interest and their interpretation of what was this place and what could one do with it. Uh, and but the space, as as the the history proved, was not uh, was not empty for everyone. It was empty for the owner who couldn't do anything with the space. But it wasn't that uh, that empty, so to say, for the artists who found their uh, very fitting home, very good place for them where to develop their art and their uh, activities. And generally, in cities where such empty places appear. This is an argument for investors then later and the state to decide on the placement of a useful building without taking account of historical and social value. In economies that are not strong enough, such as Romanians, um, rhymes are, uh, are kept and while in private ownership, as the, as the ruins of the, of the pine brush factory, they become inaccessible to those who can attribute them at least intermediary. So they are either staying empty or they are used temporarily by uh, different artists. Waiting time takes time, taking the form of letting the ruins in peace until the moment in time co is coinciding with economic prosperity will come and when their redevelopment can be more profitable. And we'll see that this is the thing which happened with the, with the Pain Bush factory in exact uh, 10 years after its opening in 2019. And in, in uh, what follows, I will present a, a short uh, uh, perspective of the, of the members of the Pain Bush factory, how they, how they reflect on the, on the creating of this uh, cultural urban space and then later on its uh, shrinking. So as you can see here, a cultural manager, a member of the, of the Federation is saying that it began very informally. There was a very open process. Those primary purpose was to find a formula. We can put ourselves together and create this collective space. For me, all this process, although of just a few months and as the whole after the process. And it was, it was indeed a very, a very intense period when many people invested a lot of money and a lot of energy and a lot of uh, creative ideas and hopes for the future, so to say. Here, uh, another uh, member, a visual artist this time, is saying that although informally it can be said that the factory has come to be like this, there has not been any urban development project in the middle but the state of affairs built up in spontaneity. There wasn't something done after a recipe, and maybe that's why it's interesting to see how this community experiment will continue. As you can see, this uh, excerpt is from uh, an article wrote in 2010. And here, for example, it's another, it's another quote from another member uh, but already uh, given to me in 2019, where she's saying that Maraj neighborhood gentrification has been made by Fabrica. Uh, and indeed, the bus on the Henry Barbu Street, where the factory building is, appeared not due to Fab Fabrica de Pensule, but because of buildings that are there and the growing area. And by this comparison of these two quotes, I wanted to, to show you that also the understanding of the members uh, changed across, across the time. And at the beginning, I think it was a, a very big enthusiasm, which also uh, materialized in some kind of naivety, which was, uh, which was described by this, by this quote. The first, which through the end, most of the people and most of the members understood that their project was also part of a bigger uh, uh, urban regulations changed and everything uh, had to, to go along. Then here, there is a, a quote about the functioning and the, the golden times, so to say, where a conceptual artist and member is saying, our togetherness meant that we made common posters, we made exhibitions that all opened at the same time. We had made an exchange of audiences. Those who were only going to one gallery now have the opportunity to visit four or five galleries. 
the collector was able to see not one artist, but 10. This multiplication effect was a great deal. And uh, as uh, I, I missed to say at the beginning, but in distant years, uh, the paintbrush factory went through a huge conflict um, among, the, among its members, which was uh, around 2013, 2014. And here, one of the most uh, conspicuous interpretations is given by one of the former gallerists from Fabrica, from the group which left after the conflict, in which uh, they say, in fact, in fact, the visual arts have broken off from the rest. Rest meaning theater, dance, cultural fundraising associations, and some artists who were very close to gallery plan B, because plan B was somehow in that fund management group. Yeah, and we broke up and it was like in all divorces, a misfortune, which eventually passed when we left the building. And here a uh, quote about the, the, the end or how people felt uh, as the time passed and it was uh, becoming more and more clear that uh, they will have to leave the space. The anthropologist, a member of the Federation is saying, the attachment to a place is somehow good. It gives you some kind of stability and you do not give up. That's why I have somehow renounced to the idea that the factory may still be what it has ever been. It will be not able to and do not deplore so much as the girls who have invested themselves into it. They have tied together, have taken root to the place. Once I got off, I see it a bit cooler as a process that has a squeeze period. So there is a very complex process of uh, growing and then degrowing of this, uh, this urban space, also as importance for the members uh, of the Fenbridge factory, but also for the whole urban uh, cultural scene. Uh, and here, uh, as, I'm, uh, as I'm going to, to the end, um, I was uh, wondering and I was uh, thinking that it may be an interesting way to look at this process as following the artistic activity that took place in the paint refractory, maybe also regarding the real things, so to say, uh, paints and the current. The space as offices by the IT, uh, the, by offices, uh, and this was also the reason uh, the Penbridge factory left because the rent was uh, becoming too high for a non profit uh, organization. The uh, rents which uh, uh, IT businesses uh, could afford. And this interest is got filled temporarily by a producing organization. Later evicted as the most saying. And my, my interpretation is that, that profit making is permanent and art is temporary. And there is just a, a kind of evolution in this uh, role of the profit making, which was decreasing before the Penbridge factory as the contemporary art center, because the, the fact after the um, 89 and and uh, it, was, it wasn't uh, profitable anymore to produce this uh, material thing. So the profit wasn't that important and it wasn't also possible. And then the role of the profit making was totally absent while uh, the, the contemporary art center was there, or at least it wasn't uh, assumed and officially a, a purpose in, to, to uh, get profit. And the third uh, uh, stage is when the, the role of the profit making is rising again, as economic and legal regulations made it possible, and the owner was able to improve the, the building with the money he collected in these 10 years, and uh, through the new businesses who are renting the space, the space there.
And here you see the picture of a, a space which was uh, for most of the time a gallery. And then in the last years, it was also a performance space. And in the last last months of the uh, of the Penberg factory in this uh, space, it was also a depository of all the the places. And I, I I decided to put this picture here because it reflects somehow very nicely for me, and I think also for the people people working there, this this feeling of uh, shrinking and this feeling of to be constrained to put all your things together and then to leave. And even though the more profitable real estate market got the Penbridge factory evicted from the space, there are some lessons to be learned from, uh, and particularly the, the commons type of organization, which I wasn't uh, enhancing in this presentation, but the, the Penbridge factory was from the beginning on uh, trying to organize itself as a as a common uh, organization which everyone had possibility and it was also a demand to participate and to contribute as such and another lesson could uh, be in the direction of the contemporary engaged art issued by the art center in its 10 years of activity and what kind of influence and what has uh, had changed uh, uh, simply put in the in the city because of the activity of this of this contemporary art center so the question of uh, what uh, the city and the people who work in this contemporary art center won and what they lost in these 10 years it's a very uh, wide and also tricky question because I think it depends very much if you want to look at it as a pessimist or as an optimist. And if you're looking at it as an optimist, it's clear that many things which we can observe now in the uh, city of Cluj couldn't be possible without the input and the creativity coming from the paintbrush factory. And maybe these experiences and these uh, also failed experiences uh, uh, could could bring some some uh, food for for thought and for future uh, experiences and tryings of the of the people. So this is the uh, the presentation I wanted to to bring to your attention. And this is uh, the picture you see here is a, a mural on the on one of the walls at the entrance of the now former space of the factory, which is uh, giving its uh, its honor to in this factory. This was it. Thank you very much, Marina, um, the, also for keeping time. Um, obviously, we will have to relate this particular local history and struggle with those that we're still to hear about. So I am now giving the floor to Cristina Dragomir from the School of Politics and International Relations, Queen Mary University of London, who will address the issue of spirituality as access to social justice. Cristina, you have the floor. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Manuela, for um, your introduction and everybody else for organizing it in such challenging times. So thank you for this. I was very much looking forward to come to tell you, but uh, hopefully next time. Um, and before I start, I would like to ask you kindly for three waivers um, for my presentation. And one of them is that um, I'm presenting for the first time on this topic. Uh, though this is a topic that um, has been in my mind for the past 10 years, um, and that was linking spirituality to social justice and social justice theories. Um, uh, I could not find a realm or an entry into social science and critical thinking with this. So I was very excited to see your topic and your engagement with this. And as a result of it, um, what you would hear next are going to be some reflections and some uh, thoughts on this rather than one of the theories. Um, also because um, this project will take place also as a research project, I can talk a little bit more 
um, further uh, during the Q&A. Um, furthermore, I think that there is, um, I paused and I thought a lot about this, uh, like why, um, why it took so long to, to make the leap and present spirituality and social justice um, within the framework of academic work. And I think that um, there, there is a very good reason for that. And mostly it's because social sciences and spirituality uh, make odd partners to say the least with a critical engagement and certain tools that are used within, uh, within social sciences that are not necessarily easily incorporated within, within spirituality. And uh, um, so that will be, I think, one of the challenges, but I'm very much looking forward to hearing your feedback and, and having your, your challenges coming from that side. Um, and also the third one is because um, it was, I think, quite difficult to break into such a large topic such as social justice and spirituality. And in doing so, what I decided uh, to do is the following. Um, I decided to focus on the environment and social justice, especially for this presentation. So I'm going to be talking mostly about environment and social justice. And um, what I would also would like to do is uh, focus on a particular program um, that is called Conscious Planet, and I'm going to talk to you in a little bit um, in a little bit further about that. So. Um, um, I chose this to as an entry into social sciences and spirituality um, as um, as uncommon as uncommon partners. But as I will speak to you next, uh, I'm going to try to um, share my screen and share the um, and share the PowerPoint as I do that. I'm assuming you already are able to see the PowerPoint, right? Yeah, but um, can you make it full screen? Oh, okay, great, thank you. All right, so um, so as um, as you can see, the um, the subtitle of my presentation is Revolution in Psychology and Spirituality. Um, and I started looking at this from a very um, human rights perspective or social science perspective, looking at how can we achieve human rights and how do we, what are human rights? How do we understand human rights and all that context, which is the work I've been doing for the past um, two years at Columbia. And um, I, um, I start from the premise that we cannot really address issues of social justice or within the framework of human rights without addressing the environment. Um, we have been addressing obviously this, but we have been addressing this in patchworks. We have been trying to limit water consumption, recycling materials, but these endeavors have been proven again and again um, of limited success. Moreover, they often, often reinforce hierarchies and dynamics of power. While limiting one's water consumption for oral hygiene is a sign of privilege for many, having access to clear water for oral hygiene is still a need for many. While recycling materials is the mantra of many wealthy Western states, the recycling tasks have been often taking place in other parts of the world, in the, in the urban slums of the so-called developing world, where they have been exposing um, the poor of the slums to the hazards of pollution. Thus, to address environment, we need a comprehensive view. We need an all-inclusive action. We need one that will bring the people, governments, institutions, and civil society actors to act together. We can no longer have patchwork. We need, in other words, a revolution. Well, this is hardly news, right? As many, as many people working on the environment in connection with social and economic issues know, a radical, all-encompassing approach is very much needed. But all our attempts, as of now, have been proven limited at best. Um, so in doing that, I said, why don't we turn our attention to something else? Why don't we turn our attention to workings in the realm of spirituality? Leaders of our time, including spiritual leaders, have been drawing the attention, our attention to catastrophic effects of the environmental destruction. So for example, in 2018, the Pope, Fra Pope Francis urged Catholics to care about the environment and for the poor, who he says um, are more likely to be hurt by climate change. In 2019, the same Pope, Fra Pope Francis has declared a global, the global um, climate emergency, warning um, of the dangers of global heating, and as a result of it, um, impacting negatively future generations, especially the poor of the society. The vision of Pope Francis is laudable, and obviously it has been quite welcomed by environmental activists. His speeches are important, 
but um, it's really still quite difficult to move away from environmental, um, to move environmental actions into, into public engagement. So then, um, we all know quite well, right, that environmental actions and activists often come at odds with, um, with CEOs and representatives of big corporations, with politicians like uh, the uh, famous, infamous president of United, uh, current president of United States, and so on and so forth. So, how are we to pursue this engagement of um, of social justice, um, particularly in the in the realm of environment uh, activism and ecology with spirituality? So, I uh, decided in order to do this, to focus on another project, not one coming from the Pope, but one coming from another part of the world, may, namely coming from India, that it's called uh, Conscious Planet. The project, it's been going on for, a past, uh, for the past about 25 years, and it took several formats. Um, it started as Project Green Hand, which was a project of planting many trees in the deforested areas of Tamil Nadu, which is the southern part of India. Um, it then uh, transformed into popular movements that took place in 2018 as uh, the call um, um, for rivers, I'm sorry, I forgot the name right now, and then um, on to Covery Calling, the recent project which took place in 2019. Um, this is a quite large project that aims to be this all-encompassing, all-addressing project that starts within um, a foundation that is called Isha Foundation, um, which has headquarters both in India and more recently in the United States, and um, has been guided by, the, uh, by their spiritual leader called Sadhguru Jagi Vasudev, who comes from the southern part um, of India. In order to do this, uh, to proceed further, I have a short video um, of Sadhguru speaking about Conscious Planet so we can delve deeper um, into the program itself. I'll stop short. If any other species. Within a few minutes, uh, but I can share the link if you're interested to find out. Had done the kind of damage that we are doing to the planet, we would have definitely found a way how to ex exterminate them right now. Ecological issues are no, no more tomorrow's issues. It is today's problem. We want to get 3 billion people on board. That ecological issues must become the issues which elect governments in the world. Right now, there's only one problem on this planet, that is the human being. So, uh, if any other species had done the kind of damage that we are doing to the planet, suppose, suppose let us say a trillion locusts landed from Mars and started destroying this planet, we would have definitely found a way how to ex exterminate them how to gas them, how to poison them, how to ensure that every one of them is dead. Yes or no? We would have done that. But now it is us. We cannot exterminate ourselves. The only way is to transform. So what is our problem? Because as the evolutionary process goes, we are the peak of evolution on this planet. Highest level of intelligence. But why highest level of intelligence has become the most serious problem? What is your understanding of intelligence? That it's intelligence is a solution or intelligence is a problem? Uh, sorry, uh, Christina, it you doesn't work for the other people. Manifest in that way. Because human beings are essentially in you know compulsive unconscious action. We don't see the video. Oh, no one can see the video. Oh, you're waiting so patiently and kindly. That it was so sweet of you. Um, so sorry about that. I really thought uh, you can uh, you can uh, you can see it. So how about I stop sharing, and I will then I will then just give you a quote of that, uh, and I'll read it myself, which will not do justice, but we'll try. We could hear it though. We could hear it. We just oh, couldn't hear it. it. 
Okay. So it was very clear. Yeah. yeah. Right. Okay. So uh, then, then the the main idea, right, is that there is only one problem on the planet, and that is human being. They are the source of social and ecological crisis on the planet. Addressing that, it's addressing um, human problems. It's addressing, in other words. Um, larger social justice problems. So let me just tell you like, so how is, um, who is, uh, who is Sadhguru? I would be happy to introduce you to that. Um, you don't see my screen, right? Let me just go back to that. Right, so, um, so um, I'll be happy to play Sadhguru a little bit further into the historical context of India, which I think it's quite important, and the new um, age context of India as well. Um, and I can definitely do this if you'd like during the uh, during the Q and A. But let me just tell you like how he is usually described. Um, he is one of the most top fifty influential people in India. Um, he has been nominated for, for several years as such. Um, he is um, quite often one of the main speakers at the large international forums, such as Davos, United Nations, and so on. Um, and he is described as being an, an a, having the unique ability to make ancient yogic sciences relevant to contemporary minds, acting as a bridge for a deeper dimension of life. And his approach does not describe, and this is quite important for the foundation itself, to any belief system, but offers methods for tr self-transformation that are both proven and powerful. Um, so this is this is what this is where he comes from, and this idea of the of the conscious planet bears with bears with with the foundation a certain urgency saying that we need obviously education but education is going to take 10, 15 to 20 years it's going to be too late for us we're not going to be able to address this we are in the middle of a crisis world institutions with which the foundation has been extensively working such as UN triple c it's quite slow in making a change however um However, uh, the change then needs to come from a different side, and that is engaging governments, key contributors, and grassroots or the people, uh, which of course has been the aim of many other organizations as such. Many other foundations, many other people have been looking at the same way. The difference between that is the spirituality side that uh, the foundation is bringing through, saying that in order to do this, we need to create a certain type of awareness, we need to increase people's consciousness and such. So what is the plan? Um, I'm going to go rather quickly over this, but again, I'll be happy to, to answer this during Q&A. And that is that, well, um, in order to engage, we need to engage government policies. And the way this could be done is only by engaging the political parties, the three top political parties of every, of every country. Only by doing that, um, there will be a change in budgets, which obviously is a slow process, but it needs to happen. And policy changes that will need to happen as a result of it. Everything is conceived by the foundation within the framework of democracy, saying that democratic, a democratic system citizens are about 3 billion people right now. If we make them aware of the environmental changes and their implication for social justice issues, then we can push governments, get the massive support, um, and move things through. But how do you do this? You do this through um, achievable projects that are already taking place on the ground. And in doing so, um, and this is a, a place of uh, that could be, I think, contested, is the area of agroforestry that actually creates the liaison between the economy and um, and uh, um, and uh, farming but it raises certain certain issues because agroforestry of course is very much linked to land ownership which um, in certain parts of the world it's still a luxury for very many people so you know ultimately agroforestry leads to a certain exclusion of of a group of people however um, in doing so this aims to address a very large problem and a very pertinent problem that um, attacks um, farmers in many places but especially in India 
in Tamil Nadu um, in terms of farmer suicide. You might know that uh, through climate changes that took place over the past decade, um, only in the southern state of India in Tamil Nadu, they have been over 40,000 sorry, over the past 15 years, there have been over 40,000 uh, farmer suicides because they get into more and more debt um, as uh, seasons are not producing, um, seasonal, um, seasonal rains are not coming. And as a result of it, crops are not being produced. Farmers are getting more and more debt uh, with the local banks leading to farmer suicide. So um, in this way, agroforestry and this uh, liaison, not to call it marriage, right, of economy and ecology um, is, um, is perceived as a solution, as a solution as such. So the large project that has been that has been launched in 2019 that addresses exactly this and links um, environmental catastrophes and environmental changes with social justice issues. It's called Covery Calling. Covery is one of the large rivers within southern India, transversing the part, um, transversing two mainly two states, Tamil Nadu and the state of Karnataka, which over the the past uh, 50 years has been depleting by 87% because of the deforestation. Um, deforestation, which of course was very much encouraged by large economic factors within, within the region and has been taking place for the past 50 years, has, lead to, has led to uh, a dramatic uh, desertification of the area also coupled with the fact that during the monsoon seasons, when, when the water falls in really large quantities, um, it actually leads to the river overflowing, affecting the peasants who have land very near the cabin, uh, the, the covery basin. Um, this is one of uh, one of the many many issues in in environment, obviously. But this is one of the larger projects that has been that has been uh, offered as a result of it. Um, and as you can see here, this is actually taken from the foundation itself, where it says, "This are the issues that are being that are being um, at hand. These are social science, social justice, sorry, issues, farmer suicide, um, farmers." Um, economic depletion, um, their um, labor, uh, labor depletion. And one of the areas that is very interesting for me, and that's where I'm gonna focus the next stage of this project is labor migration. Because of the drought that the Southern part of India it's, it's facing, um, many of the farmers become uh, slum dwellers in uh, uh, mainly within Mumbai and uh, maybe, uh, Mumbai and Delhi, um, becoming laborers working as day laborers. And as we know with COVID-19, this uh, migration, this internal migration that took place in India, due mainly due to environmental issues, has been has been quite dramatic, affecting these groups who have been returning from the slums, particularly being affected by their return migration and the impact of COVID um, of COVID nineteen. So, as a result of it, the project aims to plant trees on this particular lands of uh, of uh, peasants, uh, creating this link between ecology and economy, um, investing into the peasants economic empowerment in order for them to be able to um, crop their land and sell the timber. This is a point of uh, a point that it's often contested by environmentalists who say that once you plant the trees, which will affect in turn the, the flow of the water and the, will, will reestablish the environmental balance of Covery River. Um, you can no longer cut them. However, the project aims to produce this through, um, aims to address the environmental issues through this um, uh, empowerment of the peasants because peasants uh, as a ret in return will be able once the trees mature to cut the trees and to sell it for their own profit. Saying that only by empowering peasants, encouraging their participation and such could we actually address this, um, this work, um, the environmental action on the ground. Um, 
What is also interesting to note is that the foundation itself understands this movement as a revolution, as a revolution to a rural economy. Um, one of the reasons why that is, and I think it fits very well with the very rich history of social movements of uh, India in general, Southern India in particular, and Tamil Nadu. I can give you some examples if you'd like during Q&A or some like the very rich history that India has in terms of peasants mobilization and ruler mobilization um, and a revolutionary ethos that inhabited the southern part the southern part of India. And this is imagined as a revolution in ruler economy with a model to um, transform the ecological landscape of the region, uh, which um, has been accepted by the UN triple CC as um, a possible uh, blueprint for addressing ecological issues in connection with social justice issues in other subtropical eras of um, areas sorry, of the world. So how to achieve this? It's made very simple. It's by planting 2.2 billion trees, which is a really large number, and engaging um, in a very active manner the um, about 5 million farmers that uh, have land on the Covery Basin. Um, I uh, think I'm quite running out of time, but what I will, what I will uh, work, uh, what I will mention is that the project aims to be um, aims to be working on particularly three levels. One of them is awareness building, and this is the part where this conscious being that you heard earlier comes into play, where the idea of awareness of public social justice issues, it's related to a vision of spirituality, of understanding human beings in the larger context. This will work hand in hand with a lot of action that takes place on the ground um, in terms of uh, planting saplings, but also engaging the people, creating a movement on the ground that will later on affect the government because the idea of, of the foundation is that you cannot really implement long lasting changes without having the government um, producing policies and basically putting um, their money behind it. Otherwise, this uh, this work will prove to be insufficient. Moreover, this work needs to be um, needs to be global. The trees um, are, this is a part of a very large donation based campaign uh, that is global uh, that uh, asks for 42 rupees per tree in terms of donation, um, which um, after that the trees are being subsidized in Karnataka by the state, but also uh, by the peasants who uh, pay, I think, about 15 rupees per sapling. So they are also economically interested in this or like economically motivated or this is how this is being envisioned. Let me just quickly bring this back to how does this lead to a conscious planet, to a conscious beings. And that is that only, um, it is the vision that is being put forward that since the damage, it's coming from functioning unconsciously, the only solution has to come from human beings fun functioning consciously. Therefore, only by raising awareness could this large projects be uh, put into practice, could this, matters be addressed. So my next research steps on this, so this is just the framework that I've been working on and I'm very much looking forward to hear your views on this, is to look at the implementation of this project and how these projects are being affecting the people on the ground. I'm especially really interested in uh, how uh, returning migrants are, are reacting to this program, um, especially returning migrants because of COVID-19, the ones who, uh, who lost maybe permanently their jobs into the big cities. And Moreover, uh, from the research that I've done so far, which was mainly um, over Zoom and calls, to talk about the effect that this program has on gender dynamics. Because as migration has been taking place in the states of Tamil Nadu and Karnataka was mainly male-driven, a lot of the beneficiaries of these programs and a lot of the farmers are women. And this is also um, envisioned in certain parts as an empowerment for the women farmers as they would take it upon their hands to do this. I will end with this. I know it was a tour of force and I took you all over India and all over um, spirituality and ecology and uh, social justice, but um, hopefully I'll be able to fill in many of the gaps of the presentation in the Q&A. Thank you.
Thank you so much, uh, Cristina. That was wonderful. Um, and I'm, I'm sure there's going to be a very rich discussion. Um, so hold your horses, everyone. Um, and keep your questions in mind or uh, write them already in the YouTube channel. Um, last but not least, uh, our presentations for this panel is Maria Martelli, um, who's an independent researcher and uh, is going to talk to us about uh, more than human revolutionary voices reimagining multi-species communities and agency. I'm very much looking forward to your talk. You have the floor. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me well? Okay, just a second. I will um, share the screen. Okay. Um, so, this should be fine, I think. Okay, wait a sec. So, um, my name is Maria Martelli and uh, this is um, part, what I will be presenting is part on, of my research on animal sanctuaries in which I explore how human and other animals live together in spaces that defy anthropocentric order. Um, so in my case, by animal sanctuaries, I mean communities of human and non-human animals in which the humans care for the animals. And more specifically, I focus on sanctuaries for formerly farmed or exploited animals. So I just want to uh, spend a moment to acknowledge and thank the, the humans and the activists who made time to, uh, for this research and to acknowledge uh, the position of this research, which is with and for other animals explicitly. And I would like to specify that uh, the idea of revolutionary, the um, re use of the word revolutionary here, uh, what I mean by it is this need of uh, absolute and fundamental reconceptualization and reorganization from the ground up with recognizing that we really need to dismantle the use of other, other animals within our societies. Furthermore, um, so this is really early in the research process. Um, these are really early results, so uh, I will love any feedback that, that might come from this. Okay, so I will... Um, be presenting uh, like the framework of my research, the methodology, a little bit of the, re of the research sites, some of the findings, counterclaims, and uh, a little bit of conclusions. Okay, so the framework. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to do activist and non-extractive research. And this means that I'm trying to do this research that is engaged in, animal, in the animal liberation movement, and that also that wishes to give back to the humans and to the non-humans that it is involved with. Uh, what is really important is that I already start from an anti-species position, meaning that one, there is no good reason to assume human supremacy over all other animals. And secondly, that all animals have an intrinsic value. Third, uh, my background is in sociology, and therefore I'm trying to work this as a kind of sociology for animals that Erika Kutward wrote about. I will quote, a critical sociology for non-human animals must be a politicized sociology, and it must take account of and present a challenge to the intersected dominations of all the beings on the, on the planet we inhabit. Uh, furthermore, the stance I take is uh, posthumanist in the sense of a challenge to the humanist position of the Enlightenment and particularly to the Cartesian view that sees uh, sep a separation from a body and mind and that works as a collection of dualisms that draw distinction between nature, culture, man, animal, and so on. And uh, very importantly, I need to make an acknowledgement of anthroprivilege uh, which uh, within a system, within this system, it means obviously the privilege of being human that Simon Springer theorized. Uh, I will quote, under privilege provides benefits reinforced by anthropocentric social norms based on the species design and historical binary developed by and for humans that creates an us human and them animal. This is really easily seen when we all know it is considered derogatory to be called an animal and uh, this is the framework within which dehumanization works. <sighs> okay, so my methodology, I use qualitative research methods. Uh, what I have done until now is a few in-depth semi-structured interviews accompanied by mind maps of space that are sent by my interviewees. 
and also content analysis from social media posts written and visual of, of the last one or two years and analysis of secondary data from public interviews and podcasts. And what I wish to do in the future is participate observation and forms of multi-species ethnography so as to really center the experiences of the non-human animals with which I have not been in direct contact un up until now. Okay, so my research sites. Uh, my research sites are two sanctuaries in Romania that are vegan run. Uh, meaning the people who uh, take care of these animals are vegan. So one of them is Nima Sanctuary, which started operating in 2018 under the guardianship of Doina Badia. And right now it functions as an NGO and currently has three employees. And the non-human anim um, animal members are 20 cows, three horses and three dogs. Secondly, I also look at Spirit, uh, Spirit Animal Sanctuary, which is a, a a sanctuary that only has two human members and carers, Andrea and Nikushor. Uh, so Nikushor saved the first horse in 2017 and currently they are living with 10 horses, 10 dogs and 18 billy goats. This is a picture of uh, Maya, one of the horses that were saved from slaughter and uh, Nikushor. Uh, I really want to stress the importance of talking and presenting with images as a way of bringing in the animals. So often animals are talked about in the abstract. In this case, it is particular human and non-human animal relationship that I am exploring and I want to make this transparent. Moreover, I argue that it can be of relevance to focus on the individuality of each non-human animal given the fact that they are exploited and killed by the billions each year. So it must be clear that it is always individuals who are being killed, not abstract masses. And within animal sanctuaries, it is individuals who are given a chance at a good life. Okay, so some of my findings I will, I will go more in depth in the next slides, but really shortly put is that sanctuaries are really good at listening and responding to non-human animal voices. They're good at centering non-human animals, at caring for them against the, their disposability within the capitalist market. And uh, they also work at uh, uh, transforming the status of these animals from commodity to person. As you can see, this is a picture of uh, two of the horses that were saved at Spirit Animal Sanctuary. Okay, so first argument is that they respond to the voices of other animals. And by that, I mean, of course, they take seriously their voices and their call for help. And when they are in pain, this is how they end up rescuing this animal from the, their conditions in which they were previously. So this picture is with Doina and Nima. Nima is one of the first horses that the uh, first cows that was saved uh, in 2018, and this is why the sanctuary is also named after her. Um, so back in 2018, Ni Ni uh, Doina found her uh, in uh, in one in uh, in the village where she was living with one of the farmers who wanted to give away the cows because he was closing the farm, and uh, there was talk of finding a better place for them, but it was there was no cow sanctuary before, so ultimately. Um, after, the, after trying to find multiple solutions, Doina decided to start this sanctuary, really inspired by, by Nima and the other cows who were also there. There were four, four of the cows were first um, saved. So um, uh, regarding previous research on animal, san animal sanctuaries, there is not a lot of it, but uh, some of it is really good and really important. And this, uh, uh, Donaldson and Kimlika are, are one are two people that really theorized it really well. And they spoke about um, different models of animal sanctuaries. And one of the really uh, early and really big model is the refuge and advocacy model within, within which Nima sanctuary kind of fits. So I will say there um, shortly what they mean is that they have a duty of care. They support species typical flourishing. They do this recognition of the individuality. Uh, non-exploitation, uh, non-perpetuation, and awareness and advocacy. So of course, lots of the work is also advocacy, but really the, the central work of the sanctuary is to provide good lives for the animals who have had previously been, usually animals who had previously been really badly exploited. Secondly, 
uh, sanctuaries are really good at centering the needs of non-human animals, and this means they really take into account the agency of these non-human animals. And uh, I will use uh, the idea of agency that Latern, Donaldson, and Wilcox theorize within their research on another animal sanctuary. They write, I quote, agency as the expression or manifestation of a subjective existence. Agency means affecting the world in ways that reflect the subject's desires or will. So I will give just a, a few examples. One of the examples of uh, centering the needs and respecting the agency is respecting their chosen relationships. So really often within centuries, uh, animals uh, have friends that they feel really comfortable with, uh, both human friends and non-human friends. And uh, the sanctuaries try to respect these relationships as much as possible. Uh, uh, the other thing is, for example, at spirit animal sanctuaries, some of the horses who were saved um, really engage with human contact only, of course, all of them only engage with human contact only if they want to. So some of them really choose to not engage with human contact and they are, of course, led to what, do whatever they please. And the only contact that is necessary is for uh, medical reasons. Secondly, of course, what sanctuaries do really well is they provide refuge and also they uh, find ways to give pleasure uh, to these animals. So for example, um, food treats, uh, they learn really well which are the foods that each of the cows prefer and then also uh, massages uh, for them and, and of course some of the cows come and ask for them and then you know which ones really like, like it or which do not. And uh, thirdly, they center the an uh, non-human animal's well-being. Uh, so, for example, they have a really strict schedule of meals at Nima Sanctuary, and uh, when, when this schedule for some reason is just a little bit late, the, the cows are a little bit displeased, so the humans always try to uh, really respect the, the, um, the scheduled meals. And this is a picture of Solaris, one of the baby uh, male calf, cow that was saved recently. Um, and, uh, well, what is, I guess, really relevant to say within this structure is that uh, his mother uh, was, was, not, uh, was not able to come to the sanctuary because the farmer still needed her for exploitation purposes. Um, so uh, the people at the sanctuary had to buy the milk of his mother for him at a, at a raised cost so he could have the milk from his mother. Okay, third, what sanctuaries, I, as I already said, uh, they really try to provide care. So um, as everybody knows, animals, uh, non-human animals are usually considered disposable, especially farmed animals. So within this pandemic, a really large number of uh, farmed animals have been disposed of, which means killed. Uh, because they could not be sold. Of course, they would have been killed anyway, but this just shows just how uh, disposable they are seen to be. Um, up here is a quote from um, one of the one person who was speaking to Andre and Nikushor because they were taking Annalie, which is this goat. Uh, they were taking her to the veterinary because she was ill earlier this week. And this person said, well, with the money spent at the veterinary, he could have bought another goat. So for uh, many people, non-human animals are completely interchangeable and then they are just commodities or objects, ways of making a profit, they are not persons. Uh, of course, this was really hurtful towards uh, Andrea and Nikushor because for them, Anneli is a person to whom they have a relationship of care. So um, what, what also happens interestingly through this relationship of care is that veterinary science encounters challenges that have not been previously posed. This is also the case of Nima, as, as you previously saw, her leg was broken. Uh, and uh, Doina tried really hard to find the, um, a veterinary uh, uh, scientist to, to fix her leg because such an operation on the leg of a cow had not been done before in Romania. Uh, so they are really pushing the boundaries of the type of uh, veterinary care that can be done and that is not only done for the purposes of extracting profit from animal bodies. 
So lastly, what I've already been kind of indicating is that uh, sanctuaries kind of work at transforming the status of non-human animals from commodities to persons. So this has been uh, studied quite a bit. Uh, and uh, K uh, Gillespie writes that um, if we look at the lived experience of non-human animals under capitalism, we can see that economic interests often dictate their lives and even more often their death deaths. And then she writes that the commodity form is reliant on an object or thing being ownable in order for it to be exchanged for money in a capitalist system of trade. Um, and then, uh, uh, so what centuries try to make possible, even if this is not a legal option, is to unmake the status of property of the non-human animals. And this is what Elena Brell wrote in his uh, thesis on uh, animal sanctuaries within the US. They, he wrote about how sanctuaries really work at unmaking animal proper, property. So he quotes Catherine Verdery, uh, where she says that property itself is a process of making and unmaking certain kinds of relationships. And of sanctuaries, by the way, they work as relationships and as safer spaces, they unmake this uh, kind of status. So in this picture, it is uh, Veronica and her daughter, Benedicta. Veronica is, um, a cow who uh, starred in a German commercial, um, vegan, a vegan German commercial. And uh, the, the vegan, uh, one, the, one of the vegan actress from Germany uh, felt care for her and wanted to rescue her from, uh, from the conditions in Romania where she lived. But this was not possible because within Europe, uh, cows cannot uh, travel unless they travel for the purpose of being slaughtered or otherwise exploited. So she could not be moved to a sanctuary in Germany. Uh, so some kind of condition was found for her where she lived a little bit better. And then uh, the earlier this last year, I think she was moved to Lima sanctuary. Uh, but what they did not know at the time is that Veronica was pregnant. So she had been uh, artificially inseminated without the knowledge of the person who was uh, taking care of her. Uh, because some other people who were around her really could not find any sense in having a cow that is not pregnant or lactating. So uh, this really speaks to the fact that they are only seen as objects that uh, can make profit through their bodies by giving, well, take, having taken their milk from her. Well, I, anyway, Benedicta was born this year and uh, she will be living with her mother. So she's really one of the few cows to be born in a space that respects her personhood and will not artificially inseminate, kill or exploit her otherwise. So uh, what is really important to, to look at here is that centuries are really, really complex spaces and lots of things are going on within them. So Miriam Jones, who owns a, a, a sanctuary writes about how sanctuaries are some still places of captivity, where I quote, um, she uses the term as free as possible, because there are still fences and forced routines and involuntary medical procedures and regimes. Um, so within this context that we are given within this society, sanctuaries are currently maybe the best places in which non-human animals, especially farm non-human animals can live. But of course, we, we still need to be careful about what kind of uh, power imbalances happen within centuries and what kind of captivity is still going on. So what I am trying to argue, also together with Elena Brell, who sees centuries as laboratories where activists conceive new models for ethical relationships with animals, uh, is that centuries can be seen as transitional spaces where there are spaces for practice and for learning. Uh, as, as a hope to transition towards non-anthropocentric communities. And they are really good uh, for listening to non-human animals and to learn how to speak together with them. Uh, this is really nicely researched by Eva Mayer. So conclusions. I think uh, what is the um, really revolutionary, there are quite a few things that can be seen as revolutionary about animal sanctuaries. So one of the things is they stabilize the proper category, the categories of the proper agent that deserves care and respect. So in this sense, they could ally with all of those whom capitalism, patriarchy and other forms of supremacy deem unworthy. 
Secondly, they decommodify non-human animal bodies. And this really punches at the heart of capitalism. So it is really difficult to argue that capitalism can still properly function and grow without the use of animal bodies, which has largely helped building it. And this is really easily seen if you look at the history of colonial expansion that functioned very much uh, uh, depending on animal agriculture. Thirdly, uh, they reframe human relationships with formerly exploited non-human animals. So they, they uh, rethink what kind of care is possible and what kind of relationships are possible and how can you resist centering or seeing just the human as superior to any other form of being. And uh, lastly, as I said, there are spaces of experimentation for non-anthropocentric survival. And this is not only a, a moral matter, it is a political matter, it is a matter of justice. And of course, it is again, a matter of earthly survival as both climate change and pandemics are deeply tied to the commodification and industrialized use of non-human animals. This is a picture of Puyo and Stella, two of the horses from Nima Sanctuary. Stella had been saved for a while, while, while Puyu, at the time of this picture, is really new to the sanctuary. And you can still see on his uh, face, on his body, the, um, the traces of being uh, having been exploited. Uh, there's the, the shape of the halter on, on his face. But as I already, see, uh, as I already said, uh, we, we can really go beyond that. So uh, better relationships with other animals are possible, they are already happening, and the revolutionary potential of animal sanctuaries should not be missed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria. Uh, that's a lot of material right there to discuss rurality, and it's um, also so fitting for precisely the context that we're, we're discussing. So. Wow. Um, there's already several questions here um, for um, most presentations as I see it. So uh, you probably have seen them already because you all can read them, but I, I'll start anyway in the order in which I receive them. Um, so for Cristina from Juana Sanziana Marian, um, I'm very interested in social justice and spirituality. I'm so grateful for Cristina's candidness. Um, and the question is, it feels important to complicate the we of human-centered accountability arguments as in we caused this, though not as in pure, in parentheses, Western perpetrators and pure, in parentheses, Global South victims. So it's more of a comment than a question. Do you want to relate, uh, respond directly? Go ahead. You have to unmute yourself, please. Sure. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, so thanks, uh, Anna and Diana, for for your very thoughtful question. Um, I um, I very much agree with this, and to place it a little bit more into the the historical context of deforestation of southern India. Um, this has been done. Um, on the ground, so deforestation did not take place necessarily from we the West with the pure people on the ground. These were highly motivated by global uh, networks of the economic endeavors. So um, uh, the deforestation actually took place for a very long time um, uh, and was much embedded with scientists and with theories that said that having trees on specific land would actually lead to um, a depletion of certain minerals of the land, which encouraged farmers in return to cut the trees in really large number, leading over the years to a tremendous type of deforestation. Station. So I very much agree that we really need to challenge this, um, we versus them, and who is we and who, who is them into this, and also understand, and this actually relates, if, if I may say so, to the next question that I've seen, that I've seen here that relates to um, if I understood it correctly, and like how do we relate economic growth, development, Western modernization into all of this, into the social justice? And I think that the um, uh, all of the deforestation that took place over the past 50 years um, on the Calvary Basin has been 
deeply embedded into global economic networks and global economic processes. So I think it's very, very difficult to distinguish that. And, and therefore, um, as a result of it, there is this idea that the foundation is putting forward that we still need to incorporate economic processes in order to have um, to address these ecological issues. This economical, um, you defined them, that was one of uh, the other um, uh, folks that work here. That, that wrote here, who said economic growth, I would call it economic empowerment. And the reason why I'm saying this is not necessarily based on this particular project of uh, um, Conscious Planet, but it's on my work in the field in India and Tamil Nadu for the past eight years. And I've been working with nomadic groups uh, who are um, called Adivasi. Um, you might have heard of Dalits, which are the former untouchables, but the Adivasis are the farther Dalits, if you would like. I mean, it's it's a, the, um, the um, hierarchy um, abuse that is taking place on the Adivasi, it's, it will take um, a really long time to, to describe. And when I was on the field uh, working um, closely with them, um, economic empowerment was in all their minds. So to understand this as economic empowerment, as their empowerment, as individual, as communities, it's really quite important. And um, forgetting that aspect about their life, forgetting their aspect that there are certain needs and certain values that they also would like to share into this global world, I think it's it's an act of injustice on our part. So having this economic empowerment working on the ground is something that I really think um, is, is crucial. However, it cannot just blindly put forward. Right, like that there are certain caveats on this and understanding that when we work in the field, there are still very many hierarchies, internal hierarchies and certain people who will be uh, pushed to the, to the margins yet again. So that's really very important. But nevertheless, I think that economic empowerment is, is something to think through and definitely um, destabilizing um, the we and demystifying um, farmers, demystifying um, Adivasis, dem demystifying tribals, tribal communities as uh, the um, exotic others who don't need economic empowerment, who don't need social voices, who are just like really good by themselves doing whatever they would like to do. So um, I think it's really important to, to give them the words into, into asserting themselves as such. Hopefully that answers. Thank you, Christina. And obviously, it's not just a question of uh, West and East or North and South, but also a question of class or caste, right? Depending, or sometimes not depending um, on the context, because caste is also intermeshed with mm -hmm. uh, a reality and idea of class. And, and some would argue that race is a sort of caste, but that's like a whole new discussion. Um, so obviously, it's a, it's a conflict complex way of um, seeing through the hierarchies. To mix it up a little bit, because um, there are more questions um, for Maria, for instance, how uh, from Hestia de Libas, how could social scientists integrate an anti-species perspective <coughs> and to what other social justice movements could this perspective add on? Thank you for your wonderful presentation. Okay, th thank you for the question. <laughs> So, um, okay, first, how uh, can uh, social sciences integrate an anti-species perspective? So, wow, this is, this is really a lot of things, but I will just try to shorten it up a little bit. So, uh, recently there has been, well, not only recently, but kind of lots of talk about how to integrate uh, anti-species approaches to uh, sociology and social sciences and uh, anthropology. And we can easily think, well, this is a bit, little bit difficult because sociology and anthropology are kind of built on this distinction on human that is cultural and uh, nature that is uh, out there. But this, this, of course, has already been challenged by like since the 80s. So we can go, go beyond that. And what I think is uh, is really important, I mean, you can see the, the work of uh, Nick Taylor and Elizabeth Sherry that do sociology with an anti-species perspective, but uh, what is really helpful with this is that it really helps one think through um, all other, uh, think better with all other oppressions and to see uh, how the human is somehow constructed very often. It, the, um, 
the Western, the so-called Western human within this model of having, uh, is in a certain way, like civilized, the model of the human is like civilized, male, white, and, and so on. So um, taking a, a species, uh, an approach that really takes into account species can uh, go really a long way in understanding other forms of oppression. So I will, I will just really uh, shortly say that it really intersects quite a lot with race. I have not read enough about this, but um, the concept of race is really, really complicated and it's really difficult, the, all, the, all its histories, of course, but um, very often this concept of race has been uh, the people who have been racialized have been somehow dehumanized and all of this is related to how there has always been an other and other ways of othering that makes someone an animal and to make someone an animal is to like i already said is to dehumanize them so this uh this, you really need to have this critical approach to this because of course humans are animals but um in the last many, many years, humans have been constructed as not being animals. Uh, and this comes from many, many places, but uh, lots of it comes especially from Descartes and his dualisms and his conceptualization of mind and body. And uh, uh, with all the things that we uh, as humans and as specific kind of humans that have a specific kind of knowledge and access to, um, um, how do I say it? like. Uh, this epistemic power of uh, having our knowledge being agreed to institutionally and academically. So there, this, there's, there are institutions that can better decide who is human, who is animal, and that already do this, which has pretty much been talked to in the, in the panel before, before me. And then, of course, anti-species uh, perspective really help us understand not only this concept of race, but also gender. And this can be seen in the work of eco-feminist writers and in how uh, the fe uh, fem feminized and like feminine spaces are uh, of sometimes um, the feminine is objectified and rendered more natural or somehow more animal in different discourses and practices. And something else they I have been recently reading about how queerness can really can, can relate a lot to uh, anti speciesism of, of course, because queerness is disruptive, but even in the very lived experiences of people uh, of LGBTQA plus people. Uh, many of them uh, have this really deep relationship that they come from being in the position of being oppressed in some one way they they come more easily to social justice struggles and more, sometimes more easily see how uh, oppressing other animals is also a matter of social justice okay this has just been what has been really on my mind quickly but there's there's really a lot to see also regarding uh, the abolition of many institutions and regarding colonialism and how it has been built with animal exploitation. So there's just a lot there. And it's, it's really uh, something that we should really take into, into consideration. Uh, first, as I think as people that engage and live in a world that is in many ways dying and it is in many ways fragile. And secondly, as academics, it is interesting. <laughs> Thank you so much, Maria. Um, can you take another question? Because um, I think Christina answered two, and I don't see uh, Marina right now, so we can just as well go on with a question for you. Um, so um, Alexandra uh, Anna was asking you, how are these sanctuaries connected across various countries, if they are, in terms of exchanges of knowledges, practices, maybe coordinated strategies to decenter anthropocentrism? Okay, so that's a really good question. It's something that I have not been able to research as I, I'm already starting this year on this research and I, uh, it's been really hard with the pandemic. Uh, I know they are connected and I, I know they talk and they experience, they, they discuss lots of things regarding animal care that n literally nobody knows about and nobody else knows how to do this because the only ways in which and in, some animals are engaged with is in very exploitative and abusive ways. So they do have an exchange of practice um, and they do communicate, especially uh, when, when they need to know something that they did not know before, but I have not researched it to, to answer it in detail. Okay, um, then let's take some more questions for Christina. Um, 
I think one of them from Octavian Chorta was why should we engage with different kinds of spiritualities and not engage spiritualists in a common ethical framework such as efficient altruism. Uh, and that continues with should she, I guess is Christina's meant, bring arguments so that the Orthodox Christian Church of Romania observes fasting more closely as a way to reduce animal suffering and pollution. Um, so my, maybe that was for Maria. Maria. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> it says it might be for both of us. Um, <laughs> it might be for both of us. Um, thank you, Octavian, uh, for this and for the clarification, because I'm not familiar with the term spirituality. Spiritualists. Um, and when you speak about spirituality, you enter, I mean, I find myself at least entering a, such a murky field in which all of these concepts are being vehiculated with multiple meanings. And I know that's probably valid for almost anything, right? In a Vingestani anyway. Um, that everything has multiple meanings, but in terms of spiritual work, I think it's quite difficult uh, to, to stay away from, from murky concepts. Um, but if I understand you correctly, is that uh, should we look at particular spiritual leaders like the Pope, like Sadhguru, and why not have a more comprehensive view and have the spirituality um, as such? I think if I understand this correctly, or if I understand the discourse of spirituality correctly, um, the idea is that ultimately, uh, yeah, this is what needs to be done. It doesn't have to come from a sp specific side of spirituality or from, from another. The whole idea is to have this all encompassing or um, uh, holistic understanding of it, which of course, um, from, our, um, from a historical perspective, but also from a reason grounded perspective would lead to a lot of holes in that. But I think that what, what this is being, what um, if I can refer particularly at the, at the project that I've been looking at, which is Conscious Planet, um, what it tries to do is actually move away from all of these differences and divisions that exist within specific branches of spirituality, let's call them, or religion and engage human beings into specific forms of consciousness and also specific forms of addressing issues in environment related to social justice. Um, with respect to uh, the animal suffering, I'm not very sure, but with respect to the pollution, one of the, of, uh, one of the ideas that is put forward by the foundation is that uh, we are looking at an increased use of animals for human life. And as a result of it, a lot of the land that could be used for agriculture is being used for raising animals, which in turn are being, uh, are being used for consumption by human beings, which leads to a depletion of the soil. And in result, it actually participates into the climate catastrophes and climate changes that are happening. So um, this goes a little bit farther into this theories of environmental change changes that the foundation has been working with for a very um, large number of years. The foundation doesn't go very far, Sadhguru doesn't go that far in, in promoting veganism, but brings on this data of uh, usage of animals um, and the link that ultimately it, it has to pollution worldwide, and therefore raises questions about the way we have been living life and implicitly um, engaging with animals. But if I can use this opportunity to ask Maria a quick question, uh, since I am a little bit new to, I'm mean, quite new to this field, um, the first question that comes to my mind is, um, you you showed all these wonderful images of, of domestic animals, but I'm wondering if the theories are actually looking also at different animals such as wild animals and also animals that, in one way or the other are considered to be detrimental to human life. And as I am a resident of New York City, I cannot think of, you know, I cannot forget that there are other forms of life like bed bugs that are, you know, a form of who we are. So I'm wondering, you know, in a more cohesive way, would be how, the, how is the hierarchy of animal world being addressed within these theories, if it is, and how, how is it playing? Okay, uh, thank you for the question. So uh, it's a really broad question and I, I, it's, uh, I, I don't know exactly where to pick from. So what I focus on, what my focus was on uh, sanctuaries for formerly farmed animals, 
because these are really spaces of extreme importance, uh, given the fact that uh, factory farming kills billions of animals. I really don't know the numbers because they are too big for me to remember. And uh, what I found really important was then how can we reshape these relationships of, of extreme exploitation that, that we take part in and how can we how can we make well and do justice within, within this? Of course, uh, it is not only farmed animals that are being exploited within our societies, it is also well, um, animals in laboratories, animals in entertainment, um, and many uh, many other animals in many other ways that uh, I don't I, I don't even know the the lot of it like recently for example I just uh, learned that beagles are used for some kind of cosmetic te testing the uh, cosmetic testing which I, I did not know of like three days ago uh, so yes there is there is certainly like um, a difficulty in uh, arguing okay how can we live well with all of the earthly beings and this, uh, this, there are many ways to address this. And this is something that we really need to look careful at because lots of people say, well, it's really hard to be anti-speciesist. It's even hard to practice veganism. But what I think is really important uh, is to look at it structurally. So structurally, the, the really, these really big entanglements of systems, the economic and material that we have, capitalism, colonialism, and the, the way they, they come together with white supremacy and with uh, anthropocentrism, they really structure it so that some beings are always less than others. And uh, some of these beings very often happen to be non-human animals. So what I mean is that by anti-speciesism is that we really need to fundamentally rethink and restructure together, not we white uh, people in academia, but uh, everybody uh, taking their place, knowing their place and uh, w working at restructuring and trying to, to make justice um, with, with, all, with all others as much as possible. So this means really trying to struggle and think through diff different questions and like, okay, when is some someone a parasite? When, uh, when does my bodily autonomy start? And when does someone else's bodily autonomy start? These are really hard questions that we need to explore seriously. Thank you, Maria. Do you also want to address the question about the Orthodox Church? No. <laughs> Um, okay, then I guess um, Marina is having connectivity problems because she disappeared. Um, so hopefully she's coming back because um, there's questions to be discussed here. But um, before she does, or um, even if she um, cannot join us, um, let's maybe think about um, the, the connecting thread here. So, um, the main topic of both this panel and the panel in the morning was local histories and struggles. Um, how would you connect the struggles between, let's say, the two presentations that you were addressing? Because one thing that um, could be said is that, well, they're really far apart. I mean, there's, in a way, they're all local, but how are they connecting to revolutions? Do we need, like, revolutions on so many different levels that this is not a decolonization of revolutions or of the concept of revolution, but is basically, well, each fending for themselves because there are people who care about non-human human animals and there are people who care about how spirituality affects the economy and there are people who care more about um, non, um, how, how would you call trees? Okay, give me a concept that relates to the framework that would that would encompass trees. So the question is, how how are these struggles connected? Is the environment the connecting thread, and is that the revolution that we need, um, or is there more to it? And of course, I'm I'm being a little bit provocative because um, I'm a sociologist and I shouldn't ask a suggestive question, but of course, I mean there's more to it than just. Um, than just um, one level, but I want you to answer um, or kind of engage in a dialogue with each other. Who wants Maria, to yeah. Maria and Christina, right? Yes, please, yes. Yeah. 
Um, I mean, I, I can definitely see the the connection between between the two, and I think that one of the ways in which um, we need to address environment is a way in which we address the hierarchy of that we instituted of homocentrism, and we really need to address this because um, this has been this is has been mainly the issue. Um, since we have been using the earth on different levels for human production, um, and we have been absolutely taking it to uh, to tremendous speeds in the past uh, century because of modernization, westernization, capitalism, and so on, um, we need to rethink this in a global scale. Um, we all know that COVID-19 crisis um, has brought these views into people's minds. People have been looking into different parts of, of this um, more um, all-encompassing understanding of that, understanding where we are in relation to animal, where we are in relation to environment, seeing um, firsthand the, real, the effects of the human, that the, um, uh, crisis of COVID-19 had on humans, the repercussions on the environment are things that we can no longer ignore. So it's definitely, it's de they are definitely very much connecting on different, on different levels. And I think that um, in, in, my, in my work, this is my, my struggle uh, for, for the past like almost 20 years. And how do you make these discourses connect? And how do you make people talk to one another? Because the goals and the aims are not so different when you actually start sitting at the same table and discussing this and like, how do you approach this? We understand that we could be working at the same goals, but with different means and different ways. Um, and, and it's really just a matter of getting the right people Oh no, Christina's gone. This is boycott of radical statements. Maria, <laughs> come to this <laughs> to the rescue. Wait, or uh, should I say something? Yes, if, if you wanted to answer, let's um, kind of weave the two answers together until Christina comes back. Okay. Because I, I wanted to say something regarding what Christina said, but maybe I will say it later. <laughs> uh, so um, I think lots of things are connecting, and as I as I already said, um, I think uh, many of the struggles like it's really easy to see the connections, but then if you look at the lives of people for one person or two people, it is really difficult to engage in all of the struggles. Like difficult by difficult, I mean impossible. They cannot do it. Uh, so people who work in animal sanctuaries they, and live in animal sanctuaries, they usually work a lot because then there's like lots of stuff to do with the hay and the cleaning up and everything. They really have really little time. But this does not mean that they uh, do not build, do not try to build with bridges. So for example, uh, I quoted Miriam Jones from Vine Sanctuary. They do really amazing work there. Vine Sanctuary is um, a queer sanctuary. It is like a, a safer space, not just for animals, but also for queer people. Uh, and uh, they also work within a framework of liberation and they try to engage with social justice uh, as much as they can. So um, this, is, this is one way in which everybody does like a little bit and tries to connect. Like this is really important. What you said, the the connection and trying to build like a broader movement that is not just the animals movement or not just the um, housing movement or whatever movement that tries to to build. So this this is doable and this can be done. It just takes a lot a lot of work and I I really need to stress that there's. Uh, a lot of emotional work as well, and a lot of work done by women. And I, just going back to the early presentation this morning from uh, Alexandra Anna, which was really beautiful. She really showed how these connections are possible within feminist and queer Roma spaces in Romania. So obviously this is happening. It's just difficult and we really need to appreciate it. Appreciate it. And um, going back to also maybe Marina's presentation and uh, I think the issue of commoning is really important and all this work of trying to make common spaces and trying to do something together um, 
which again can can fall into like can can somehow fail, but maybe like like had like it happened with the Fabrica de Pensole, but it didn't really fail. It did it did lots of awesome things, and it uh, it really worked for for quite a long time. Uh, so. There, there's just, you know, uh, the the things that are at work against us are really, really big. So there, there must be lots of support coming and like lots of energy. <laughs> yes, thank you. Or well, I didn't hear her. <laughs> I missed a little bit. But if I can say to to Maria, I think that what what um, your work is doing and your aim, it's quite revolutionary in itself. I mean, it leads to uh, uh, dismantling of hierarchies that are so embedded and function uh, on so many levels that in order to have an understand a different understanding of of animal life and they are they are in our role within it it needs to have a, a revolutionary transformation of and reconceptualization of who we are and our centrality or lack of centrality within this so um, I think it's it's quite it's quite crucial that, um, as I was saying earlier, that these discourses connect and and start uh, speaking to one another um, in this way rather than just separately looking either at human life or environment and so on. I I truly think that we we live in a in in an emergency um, world in a where we really need to act immediately and we really need to be engaged at every level so and yeah that's we tried simple solutions and they never worked uh we tried being singular in our approach and it never worked unless we all kind of come together and challenge ourselves mostly within the process and challenge our basic assumptions and and start working through and i would say we are we cannot be shy of trying new things because whatever we did so far we were very limited in our success and and that's why a revolutionary understanding of it one that uh challenges the framework of western um western uh, hegemony really needs to be at least looked at um looked at carefully and and uh, and put into conversation so we can move forward because obviously it hasn't been working so far. So. Thank you, Cristina. I was also listening to uh, Maria's presentation. I was um, reminded of how um, I first heard about research on this topic 20 years ago um, from a colleague at the university where I was back then. It was also a small German university, Catholic university is that. And the colleague was a non-tenure sociologist. And he was talking about, well, the term he used back then was animal sociology and that attracted him so much derision it was like oh my god didn't you find another niche there was no space there was absolutely no space to talk about it and this was somebody who had a very solid theoretical foundation who was very carefully kind of teasing out um the the cartesian binarism involved in even thinking through the division and it wasn't that environmentally um, differentiated or the critique of environment within that was not um, as differentiated as in, in your presentation. But again, that was 10, 20 years ago. But it was so out of the question that it would be even considered sociology that I felt very happy listening to you to see the, the wealth of information and the the data, the research that goes into it, and the publications that you cite, and the confidence that you bring to the topic, that was is also a part of a moment. It, it's a paradoxical, because you need a crisis, um, or more of a crisis. It's really a catastrophe, um, to even make these kinds of topics maybe not mainstream, but to bring them into the discussion. And this, I think, relates a bit to what we were discussing this morning. Um, what does it take to bring critical or radical discourse to um, a broader audience? When Miruna was saying, well, I, I want to do this niche course in order to mainstream post-coloniality. Before we mainstream, we even have to open up a little bit of a door and 
for people to even acknowledge that this is a door and not say, oh, this is actually outside of the scope of your discipline. And that in itself is very ironic because what are disciplines, right? They are <laughs> who created those. And now we're refining them by, by insisting on the, on the boundaries. Sorry, I was just like um, enthusiastic about the, the possibility to have these conversations. And this is precisely why we think the, the space at the Jewish Summer Conferences is, is a special place because we can talk about these things um, and not start um, with a defensive stance, because as you all know, uh, kind of big academic conferences where you present a niche subject, start like, I'm sorry, I'm just, I'm, I'm new, I'm, this is just my small project and please do not tear me apart. And sometimes tearing the speaker apart is part of a ritual, um, just a, a rite of passage, so to say, and we don't do that here. <laughs> um, and, we're so happy to, to be learning from all of you. Um, I guess we're still missing um, Marina. So, okay. <laughs> okay, um, yeah. Juana Sanziana Marian has another comment. Appreciate your framing about your colleague, Manuela. Yes. Um, just re remember how we make each other's work and each other um possible yes um i'm not yeah <laughs> yeah Maybe. i also wanted to to thank you i i was a little bit afraid because i have been studying this field and the field of critical animal studies and whenever uh, the scholars from there and some of them are tenured professors whenever they speak about it and how it is perceived it is always like oh everybody kind of doesn't take us seriously or doesn't take us seriously enough so I was, uh, I, I, I knew this was a possibility. <laughs> um, but I, I also kind of received a little bit of strength because just earlier last week, I presented at the Vegan Sociology Conference, which was the first, first time this year. Um, so that, that, that things are happening. <laughs> yeah, no, it's good to know, really good. Um, okay. Any other questions from within Zoom or I don't see any new ones on YouTube. Uh, there's one for Marina. I would have one for Marina. Me but too. <laughs> <laughs> Another one. Uh, yeah, um, as much as we were trying to go um, kind of to overcome technical difficulties, um, they haunt us. And so too bad we can't have um, everyone involved in the dialogue, but it's fine. Uh, we were very diligent and we were um, having a very rich discussion. So I guess uh, it's fine if we take a longer break and um, come back in three quarters of an hour. And uh, maybe just to be in character, let me see. Uh, we can go to Hovra's bar, the iconic place that um, we would otherwise all um, retreat to both in the breaks and sometimes instead of some events. Um, and so we are all welcome to Hovra's bar. Uh, it's um, a bit darker than it would be at this time, but that's fine. Um, so see you in a little bit. And thank you so very much for a very rich session and for all your um, exciting comments and questions. Thank you so much, Manuela. Thank you very much, everyone. Cred că am rămas doar noi. Uh, încă mai suntem live on YouTube. Așa am pățit și mai devreme, așa că nu mai zic nimic. <laughs> Îți mulțumim, Manuela, pentru tot efortul. Acum, dacă suntem tot pe YouTube. Cu <laughs> <laughs> mare drag. <laughs> Dar e, e cu tot alt, alt efort pe Zoom decât în sală, că așa în sală să moderezi dacă tot te interesează și asculți nu e nicio, nicio problemă, dar pe Zoom să te uiți și la chat și de unde vine și cine are conexiune și cine 